All right, guys, it's time to talk about the basics of IP networking. We made it to chapter 11. Congratulations. This is perhaps the most technical. It probably is the most technical chapter, but it's the most rewarding. It's where your church can save the most money when it comes to video production. So thanks for powering through. We got to do this. It's, it's really important. And in an effort to help you guys go from a crawl to a run, we're going to leverage what's called the New Tech NDI which has a free tool pack of IP video production tools that I'll brief you on um, that'll really get you up and running right away. Um, the new tech NDI is an IP based video production protocol that uses a regular gigabit network um, infrastructure. There's two or three different types of network infrastructures that you probably already have in place. There's a 10, 100, there's a gigabit, and then unlikely that you have something more than that, a five gigabit or a 10 gigabit network. If it's a 10, 100 network, we can't use it for video production. I'm sorry. We need at least a gigabit of data. And the reason why is because a gigabit is a thousand megabits. And each you know piece of data going from your computer to another computer to a camera to any other video production software needs to have a basic, let's call it a pipeline of data that needs to start really at a gigabit, which is a thousand megabits. And we'll talk all about that, but just briefly, as we we're looking at the slide here, let's talk about the basics. So ethernet cables connect each device to a network switch, which acts like a hub inside your local area network. A local area network, you might hear people call this the LAN. It's just a group of connected computers with associated devices that share communication lines or wireless links to a server or a router. And every device on the network has an IP address. It's called an internet protocol address. And generally it might look like 192.168.1.100, or it could look like 216.3.128.12. But let's look at an example IP address table here to give you uh, a little bit of an example of the basics foundation of what a network looks like. So 192.168.1.0, and again, it might look different on your network, but that's a basic IP address. It's actually a very standard one. This would be the number that identifies the network as a whole. So that dot zero is the network as a whole. Dot one would be assigned to the router. And a lot of times, just as shorthand for us IT guys talking about networking, we just talk about the dot whatever it is, because the first... 123.123.1 or one, there could be three numbers there. The first three octets are going to be the same usually within your local area network up to 254 devices. Generally, there are subnets and other ways to connect networks, but basics here, you're going to have up to 254 IP addresses available on a single IP range. Now let's take a look at a, basically an example church network used for video production. We have cameras, we have computers, and the, and the computers might be used for video production. We might have another computer connected to displays that are powering uh, confidence monitors on stage, or maybe a display in your lobby showing uh, video from the live stream, all connected over your local area network. Each computer or camera could either have a static IP address, which is assigned manually, or a dynamic IP address, which is set uh, automatically. So static IP addresses never change, and therefore they are much better for managing an IP address table on your network. Dynamic IP addresses are managed by your router using DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. DHCP is ideal for devices that periodically connect and disconnect from your network. So a prime example of an IP connected device that uses DHCP would just be a smartphone. When your smartphone connects to the Wi-Fi, it automatically gets an IP address from your network. It's considered best practice to assign static IP addresses to the most important devices on your network, especially when used for video production. This is really important when you're using cameras that communicate directly with your video production software using that address. So without getting too complicated, we've got 254 devices on a single network and they can all communicate together. Let's take a look at this table next to the, the network. So we've got the router, which is connected to the network switch. The router is really kind of like the brains behind the operation. The router you'd probably get from your internet service provider. Sometimes it's called ISP. Maybe that's Comcast. Maybe it's Verizon. Maybe it's AT&T. Maybe it's, you know, Cox. Maybe it's, there's just so many different ISP internet service providers. 
that router might is going to have an Ethernet connection. Maybe it has four Ethernet connections. Maybe it has built-in Wi-Fi. Maybe you have a router at your home. Maybe you've got a home network you don't even know about that you could use to make a mini network like this. Uh, the router might even have Wi-Fi built in. So, uh, but in this network, we have a network switch, which might have 20 ports on it, let's say. So we can connect 20 devices to that network switch. We can even connect another network switch to that network switch to add 20 more. Um, and it's a gigabit network switch. We talked a little bit about that. And the computer has an IP address. Each computer, each camera has an IP address. And the IP joystick has an IP address. But the iPad and the smartphones, they do not have static IP addresses. They were assigned dynamically. Now, let's quickly talk about IP-based video production for churches, and then I'll explain this, um, this setup here. So generally, to extend video, we would extend HDMI or SDI cabling, which has limitations and it's quite expensive. But Ethernet cabling, which we're going to run to cameras, to computers, to uh, uh, everything on our network, can power devices. We can power a camera. We can power up things up to televisions now with PoE++. So uh, we, we actually are going to have a whole interview with PoE Texas CEO Tyler Andrews soon uh, that's going to actually cover it in more detail. But we can use all of these devices connected together. So when your computer is connected to the router, it requests an IP address from your router. Your router responds by giving a local, uh, getting a local IP address uh, from the server uh, that is your internet service provider. And it gets out to the internet, it gets out to what's called the WAN. So the local area network is all of your devices on your network that are all protected behind your firewall. But when we get out to that wide area network, that's kind of the wild west, if you will, uh, which your internet service provider uh, actually uh, kind of manages for you. And it goes back and it says, all right, what do you want from the wide area internet? Well, we'd like Facebook. We'd like facebook.com. We want to check out Facebook and get our RTMP information to live stream to Facebook. So we get that information and then we can also stream out to the wide area network. So we're downloading data from Facebook, but we're also uploading Facebook directly through our router to the internet service provider to Facebook servers, which somehow, I know this is insane to think about, simultaneously practically only a few seconds later delivers it to all kinds of millions of people all around the world. Crazy. Now, that gives you an overview of what's happening on the internet, Facebook, YouTube, streaming out to the world, but we're focusing today on IP-based video production, which is happening on your LAN, your local area network inside your church. Now, let's take a look at this chart here, the NDI bandwidth. There's two different NDI modes. So um, we have NDI, which is an IP-based video production protocol, which is available in full NDI and NDI-HX, which stands for high efficiency. NDI is considered a full bandwidth compression version, which can take a 3 gigabit, 3G SDI, right? 1080p at 60 frames a second, fully uncompressed video signal and compress it down to 125 to 200 megabits per second without producing any noticeable digital artifacting. And this type of compression is what makes IP video production possible. If you think about it, we've got a gigabit switch. We have Cat5e gigabit cabling. We only have 1,000 megabits. There's no way we could send 3 megabits down a 1,000 megabit, or sorry, 3 gigabits, or 3,000 megabits down a 1 gigabit pipeline. We just can't do it. But if we compress it, we can. And that is what really makes all of this happen. So this type of compression is what makes it possible on a gigabit networking infrastructure. The compression effects are unnoticeable to the human eye and completely unnoticeable once the video reaches its final destination all the way over there on Facebook or YouTube because we have to compress the entire video production anyway to live stream it via RTMP and get it out you know, over the wide area network with our internet service provider. So New Tech was very happy with for three or four or five years with its NDI compression of 1080p uh, getting down to 150 megabits per second. But if you only have a gigabit network and you've got five or six 125 to 150 megabit per second uh, bandwidth sources, then you can only have four or five of them on a gigabit network before you have nothing left. So New Tech realized this and said, let's create NDI HX, high efficiency video. And what that allows you to do is you can actually have uh, compression down that 1080p, let's say 30 or 1080p 60 video, down to just 12 to 8 megabits per second. 
Now, only certain devices support NDI HX. PTZ Optics cameras do, uh, Panasonic cameras do, and there's some other, like the NDI Spark, which is an HDMI to NDI converter, uh, supports this type of, of compression. So let's take a look at an example church setup, and I think this will help kind of reel this whole thing home. So as you can see, there's obviously a big difference between full NDI and NDI sources. And we have to remember that we need to, a lot of IT professionals recommend 30 to 60% headroom space for reliability so that your bandwidth, you know, it can fluctuate. And we need to keep some bandwidth available for just basic communications for our printers, for our computers. And we don't want to use it all up for video production, obviously. But let's say we have the NDI scan converter on a laptop. And this is a free tool from the NDI tool pack that I recommended you guys get. I believe it is available. I'll give you the link here. It's at newtech.com, N-E-U, sorry, N-E-W-T-E-K.com slash NDI slash tools. Sorry about that. Newtech.com. You'll find it. Search for NDI tools. And that NDI scan converter can be put on your pastor's laptop and it can convert whatever's on your, your, your pastor's laptop to an NDI video signal that you can bring into OBS, Wirecast, vMix, XSplit, any live streaming software on your local area network that supports NDI. So NDI uh, would be taking up 125 megabits per second, 12.5% of your gigabit network switch just by using scan converter. Now, if we have two NDI monitors, these can be used for a lot of different reasons. Basically, monitoring any NDI source on your network. It could be the output of your camera. It could be the output of your video production software. It could be any NDI source on your network. They'll use 125, roughly, megabits per second each. So another 375 megabits per second. So we've already accumulated 500 megabits per second by the time we get to a vMix output system in 1080p at 60 frames per second with another 12%. Now, if we want to use a want to show a monitor in our overflow room or our lobby, that will be another 125 megabits per second. And you can see we're already at 625 megabits per second. So it's a lot of bandwidth, right? Well, with that being said, we can still add five to 10 cameras because PTZ Optics cameras using NDI HX will only use 12 megabits per second each, so 1.2% each. Uh, and then we can still respect the suggested headroom of at least 25%. That's a minimum of 25%. And that's what, what New Tech says. It's kind of like the minimum, minimum there. And we can now have uh, a video production system, which now we're running no HDMI cables, no SDI cables all over your local area network that it's possible that you might actually have it in place already. So here's a system. Now we're going to talk a little bit about multicast video. Now, again, I really do recommend for this one to read the book because it's difficult for me to just skim over this stuff. And, uh, but I just want to give you a high level overview because this is, this is pretty technical stuff. But what you can have is what's called multicast. And NDI HX and PTZ Optics cameras are enabled with multicast. What that means is you can have as many video streams on your multicast enabled and set up properly network switch to have as many people viewing it as possible. So you could have, as, as needed. So you could have your main live streaming computer connected to the camera. You could have a second live streaming computer that's set up for maybe broadcasting in Spanish. You could have another computer for a camera operator and you can have the camera shown on an overflow display or a lobby all of that happening at the same time, and it wouldn't add any additional bandwidth. That's what multicast does. And I, I put this example here because some of the larger churches are starting to reach out and using Spanish. And if you have one person who can uh, read uh, or can tr transcribe and actually speak in Spanish during your presentation, you can have a complete. You can have the exact same cameras, the exact same live streaming system, just two different broadcasts. And it's really powerful stuff. And, it, you know, all you need is another computer. That's the kind of thing that you can do with IP-based video production. So to get a little more technical on this, again, we're doing the technical stuff here. The high-level stuff is in the book. Um, every camera needs an IP address, right? But every camera also needs a multicast address. Multicast tables are separate to your IP address tables. So you have to keep that in mind. So each device that you want to have uh, have a multicast address on your multicast enabled switch is going to need 
their own unique multicast addresses. Now, uh, I have some information here, and I'm going to uh, provide a reference in the bottom of the notes of this video on how to select a network switch for IP um, video production, because clearly IP video production is going to require a high quality network switch. Um, and once we have all that set up, uh, you are ready to take advantage of IP-based video production. I hope you enjoyed that high-level overview for how your church can take advantage of IP-based video production. You can listen to the audio book. You can download the chapter on Kindle or get the book. I just wanted to give you a high-level overview of what churches are doing to use IP-based video production to save money, save time, and really do more. Uh, it's definitely the next wave forward, and I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching. So I hope you enjoyed that video. I don't know if you know this, but we have a Facebook user group called Churches That Live Stream. And I really highly suggest you joining to learn more, collaborate with like-minded church media and pastors online. And then pick up the book. It's a great read. It's only $9.99. You can listen to it on Audible. And it's only $2.99 on Kindle. If you take my online course and you don't have the uh, funds to buy the book, I do include excerpts from the book, everything you'll need to learn and help your church live stream for free.